This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? You walk into the assembly room. There you're met with a lion, a police officer, and all of your fellow classmates. What the hell is going on? Well, it's dare time. Let's learn about drugs, kids. Or rather, let's learn about how to say no to drugs. While you and your fellow classmates wait for the lesson plan to begin, you watch as they wheel out some props. Is that a lung? Yep. Why is it black? Well, that's what happens when you smoke, they tell you. The officer begins riddling off a list of narcotics you've never heard of before, and without telling you why, he instructs you to just say no if these are ever offered. You nod your head, wondering why, as a fifth grader, you'd ever be in that situation in the first place. Still, you and all your friends practice saying no. As the hour continues, the person in the uniform explains that if you don't just say no to these mysterious substances, your whole life will be turned upside down. Your grades will drop, you'll leave school, you'll never get a good job, and you'll end up in jail. But he never once mentions what you can do if you ever do experiment with usage. There's no offer of life after addiction. They portray it as a choice that you made where all hope is lost. Of course, if you ever see anyone using these substances, you are instructed to report it anonymously in a handy dandy box that has been set up at your school. What happens to the person you report? Well, they don't tell you that either. All they say is that reporting is the right thing to do and because he's a police officer, you need to listen to him. After the hour is up, you leave the room confused about the absolutely bizarre lesson you were just given. Then you're made aware that this will be happening for the next 17 weeks. And so it begins. You are officially part of the legendary D.A.R.E. program and an hour of your life every week will now be filled with what seems to be the complete opposite of motivational speeches, full of fear mongering and complete scared straight messaging. But everyone has deemed this program to be a resounding success and your parents are thrilled that you will finally be participating. Except that resounding success isn't all that it seemed. What if I told you that the children who experienced D.A.R.E. were actually more likely to experiment with drugs than those who didn't? What if scientists had known this since the program's inception and were silenced by leaders making threatening calls to their children? Well, that's exactly what we're gonna be looking into. Look out, Dare, because I'm coming for you. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be talking about the D.A.R.E. program. It was everyone's favorite time of the year, at least that's how I kind of remember it. Once a week for 17 weeks, police officers and everyone's favorite lion came prancing into the school armed with lesson plans, all aimed to teach kids one thing and one thing alone, don't do drugs. Sure, the lesson plans were an hour long and sometimes gruesome because showing the after effects of drug abuse to fifth graders is normal, right? but at least you got a break from math class. Every week was focused on a different topic. One week may be the criminal consequences of drug use. Another teaches resistance techniques, resisting drugs, not the D.A.R.E. program. While the next might be on quote, drug use alternatives. What the hell does that even mean? Anyways, after sufficiently being taught how to just say no, everyone is rewarded with the biggest honor of all, a pencil. The pencil says, too cool to do drugs, which you immediately sharpen down to just say, do drugs, because you're in fifth grade and that's obviously the funniest part of it. As a side note, what a terrible design choice by Dare. Like, did anyone not immediately sharpen these pencils down and laugh for 20 minutes straight, or was that maybe slightly intentional? Anyway, then you're given a piece of paper and told to write an essay, which will be graded to explain what does Dare mean to you. You may have responded by saying things like, I feel that doing the D.A.R.E. program can help you prevent the doing drugs in the future thing. Kids who don't do D.A.R.E. get jealous of adults and smoke when they're below 18. Or maybe you wrote something like, some of the things that I learned in the D.A.R.E. program are how to be drug free, avoid violence and be responsible because if you don't, you're going to have lung problems, be beat up and go to jail or juvenile prison. How fun. So once you're done with your 17 hours of lessons from your friendly neighborhood D.A.R.E. officer, get your pencil, write your mandatory essay, and maybe sing a song for your fellow classmates and parents, you are officially a graduate of the D.A.R.E. program. Congratulations. You will now officially be drug-free for the rest of your life thanks to all these wonderful lessons. Or will you? We'll get back to that. So the question here is where did this program come from? And why did we start giving 17 hour long lectures to kids? Well, we need to go back in time to the 1980s. The war on drugs is going strong. 
Nancy Reagan is showing up on TVs across the United States, begging people to just say no to drugs. Eggs are being cracked to show this is your brain on drugs and incarceration rates are skyrocketing. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, California, Daryl Gates, the LAPD police chief, was becoming overly concerned about the state of drug use in schools. He told the LA Times in 1993, we had buy programs in the schools where undercover officers would buy drugs from students. We kept buying more and more. It was appalling and depressing. I finally said, this is crazy. We've got to do something. And am I the only one that finds this idea of police officers going into school and conducting sting operations like a tiny bit unethical? Just to clarify, this is not 21 Jump Street, but basically what he was saying is that they were arresting too many kids for drug possession or sales and wanted to develop a program to address the issue. Daryl Gates and the rest of the LAPD leapt into action and started to develop a program with the LA Unified School District with one goal in mind, boosting the self-esteem of students so they can resist the temptation to do drugs. Together, Gates and Dr. Ruth Rich, who was the health education specialist in the district, worked to develop a program for students in schools. Gates had only one request. He wanted police officers to teach the program. Dr. Rich agreed due to her belief that cops are more familiar with criminal culture. Just like that, Drug Abuse Resistance Education, AKA DARE, was born. But not everyone was so excited about it. Some of those on the research team had some hesitancy in handling an experimental education program over to the local police. They didn't have education, mental health, or rehabilitation training. Why would they teach this program? Well, because Gates insisted on it. That's why, like seriously, that's actually the only reason. As it turns out, their concerns were very valid, but we're not quite at that part of the story yet. By September, 1983, DARE made its first appearance in LA schools and quickly gained traction all over the United States. As the Washington Post puts it, politicians realized that by supporting DARE, they could paint themselves as pro-cops and pro-kids. It's a win-win. In the 1980s, that definitely was, but maybe not so much now. Either way, by 1988, the program had become so popular that Ronald Reagan gave DARE its own personal holiday. President Reagan was thrilled by DARE's perceived success. To his knowledge, it was helping children improve in their studies, get better grades, and of course, stay away from drugs. In celebration of this massively successful program, he designated September 15th, 1988 as National DARE Day. And he instructed the general public to use the special day to increase awareness of DARE in the United States. If Reagan had made this an actual day off from school, that would have done more for the DARE program than literally anything else. What a great incentive. Say no to drugs and get a day off for school. Now that's a win. Before long, the D.A.R.E. program was being taught in 75% of the schools in the country and was raising millions of dollars in federal and state funding. Get those dollar dollar bills. But there was only one small problem. Remember those concerns about police officers teaching the program or the so-called massive success? Well, everything wasn't as it seemed. And while everyone seemed to be celebrating the program, researchers were desperately trying to warn people that, hey, this may not work after all. I just wanna start this section off with a quote from Vice because it's sheer perfection. If you attended school or smoked crack in the last 30 years, you probably graduated from D.A.R.E. And to be fair, they're probably right. Shorty, who attended the D.A.R.E. program told Vice, they told us how addictive crack, cocaine, and heroin are, the statistics, the numbers, the probability of becoming addicted after the first hit or dose. You know what that made me wanna do? Smoke crack, snort cocaine, and do a dose of heroin to see if I could beat the statistics. I did it all. So do you mean to tell me that if you tell teenagers not to do something and the consequences of that thing is that they do it out of spite? No way, now who could have seen that coming? Now, of course, that's exactly what teenagers are gonna do, especially if that information is relayed to them in a one hour lecture format by an officer reeking with a, how do you do fellow kids attitude. Another person, Cliff, told Vice that the most influential part of the D.A.R.E. program was when a formerly incarcerated person came to talk to them. This was someone that reminded Cliff of himself, who came from the same background, making it easier for Cliff to relate, not the police officers. Chandra said that D.A.R.E. wasn't effective because it was led by authority, which kind of gives you a scare tactic. Now, these interviews by Vice were conducted in 2014, nearly 30 years after the D.A.R.E. program was implemented. Everyone interviewed had attended D.A.R.E. and surprise, surprise, everyone interviewed became addicted to drugs too. But surely this was brand new information, right? We wouldn't have continued a program knowing it wasn't helping, would we? Well, unfortunately, it turns out we would and we did. 
In fact, research started showing that DARE was ineffective only a few years after Reagan declared National DARE Day. But, and I know this is shocking, the massive amount of money the program was bringing in blocked any of the research from coming out to the public. The original DARE curriculum, also known as SMART, was found to be ineffective. You'll notice the DARE program has a habit of changing its name to run from their problems. Not only that, but it was actually making drug use worse, or at least it was correlated to higher rates of drug use. Now, of course, correlation does not equal causation and all that, but still, it's not a great sign. After insistence from the Department of Justice, the National Institute of Justice and the Research Triangle Institute conducted a thorough investigation into the effectiveness of DARE in 1994. Following their review, they found that the program had either an incredibly small or no effect on drug use in the future. After discovering that the government loved program wasn't doing what everyone was hoping it would do, the National Institute of Justice actually refused to publish the study. Well, why? It's because they claimed the DARE program had made slight changes that made the study results void and even claimed that these small changes were enough to call for a new evaluation. Just for the record, the changes in the program weren't even close enough to change the study results, but you know, go off, I guess. Richard Clayton, who had conducted his own study on DARE with the University of Kentucky, finding the same results, told Reason.com, I'm really not surprised NIJ refused to publish it, but I'm disappointed. DARE has a leadership role to play because it's in half the schools. An organization that receives that much public funding has an obligation to be honest with the public. And I mean, he's right. And the researchers at the Research Triangle Institute agreed and began shopping around for academic journals to publish their results. But again, they faced opposition from the leaders of the program. The directors tried to pressure the American Journal of Public Health to not publish the study so that they could maintain their funding and rapid growth of the program. However, it didn't work and it was published anyway, much to the dismay of the program. One of the authors told Reason that DARE taught kids to have respect for police, fine and dandy. But if it's sold for the prevention of drug use, it's not working. Still, no one seemed to feel comfortable speaking out against it. You see, parents loved DARE and it's the parents that vote, not the kids. One of the early directors even told the LA Times that quote, "'Knocking Dare is like kicking your mother "'or saying that apple pie doesn't taste good. "'For 10 years, I've been living and breathing Dare, "'and it's all been about helping kids. "'That's our program, "'and that's what we're going to keep on doing.'" And while I love your commitment to government funding, Mr. Dare director, it wasn't helping kids and denying that wasn't going to make it start. There were even suggestions that people associated with the program would threaten reporters or academics who tried to speak out against it. And I'm not talking about little warnings either. I'm talking about people slashing tires, harassing children, making repetitive phone calls, and even reportedly jamming the television transmission of a news report to hush criticism. This was apparently so common that critics started calling it being dared. And it's wild to me that a supposed self-esteem and honesty program was so determined to silence criticism that they allegedly were doing all of these things. Of course, they denied that any of this ever happened, but given their 20 plus year tradition of ignoring or flat out denying criticism of the program, it wouldn't surprise me if all of this was true. Either way, despite growing evidence around it, the program pushed on, ranking in millions of dollars in funding in the process, around $600 million to be exact. In 2000, after the Department of Education conducted an audit of drug education programs, it took a huge hit. Only a certain amount of programs were eligible for funding, and it turns out, DARE wasn't one of them. Then three years later, the GAO or Government Accountability Office conducted its own investigation. And when they step in, it's usually not the best sign. Not surprisingly, they found the same results as countless studies before them. DARE wasn't keeping kids off drugs. So slowly but surely, the program began losing money. And by 2009, they were in debt. It seemed like this was the death of DARE, but don't worry, it came back because it always has to. So first, let's talk about why it failed. How could a program run by police officers taught lecture style with a catchy jingle possibly fail? Well, let's solve the mystery gang, shall we? We've all come home from school and had our parents ask us, so what did you do today? Or maybe you went to a friend's house and your parents asked you, did something exciting happen? All normal questions, right? Well, what if you answered those questions and your parents started tossing your room looking for drugs or acting really suspicious of you out of nowhere? Would you be confused? Would you ask for a Pepsi? Because I sure would have been. As it turns out, these questions were all part of a giant questionnaire developed by Dare to gauge a child's stress level. The book would give parents a list of questions to ask their kids, like did something exciting happen? Or if they tried hard to win a game. 
If their children answered yes to any of these questions, then quote, the parents should be wary of possible drug use. When the founding director of D.A.R.E., Glenn Levant, released his book, Keeping Kids Drug Free, a researcher decided to randomly select 30 seventh graders to complete the questionnaire. Well, guess what happened? 29 of them answered at least 11 questions with yes, which put them in the danger zone of future drug use. And I don't know about you, but that seems like an extremely unrealistic amount of randomly selected children who were allegedly in trouble for drug use. But what do I know? Again, simple pyramid on the internet. Still, I would love if someone explained how exactly they came up with this incredibly out of touch and frankly bizarre list of questions, but I couldn't find an exact explanation on why a child saying yes to them playing hard in a game was a sign of drug use. Parents were asked to become involved in another aspect as well, abstinence. And that's right, Levant suggested in his book that parents who don't want their kids to abuse drugs should themselves refrain from drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes. And while I agree that yes, smoking cigarettes in front of your kids is usually a bad move, Drinking in moderation is completely normal in adulthood. In fact, multiple studies at the time showed that there wasn't much of a relationship between the parents abstaining from drugs and alcohol and their children experimenting. Despite that, Levant suggests that his studies found that kids whose parents asked them to get a beer from the refrigerator to light their cigarette or to mix their drink are more likely to use drugs. In case you were wondering, those studies that were supposedly done by Levant are nowhere to be found anywhere. I literally cannot find those studies. It's like they came out of thin air. Either way, these suggestions for parents to worry about their children based on a questionnaire or abstain from alcohol and cigarettes were not at all based on evidence, and they did not help assist in the drug preventative objective of the program. But anyway, this is just one example of the things that were found to be completely ineffective in the D.A.R.E. program. And then there's the manner in which they were teaching it. Now, be honest with me here for a moment, just think about it. If someone spontaneously came to your school when you were six to 14 years old to give a giant, long, and often dull lecture, how engaged would you be? Would you zone out? I know I would, and so did most everyone else. At such a young age, it's unlikely that the information coming from these sessions is really sinking deep into your mind. And as if the lectures weren't bad enough, they were taught by police officers who seem to be trying way too hard to be relatable. Like, you're just not. As it turns out, those people that originally warned the police officers teaching the program could be harmful to its effectiveness were absolutely right. Instead of focusing on the physical and mental effects of addictions or support if someone were to become addicted to drugs, the police officers of the program focused more on the punitive approach. Otherwise saying, don't do drugs or you'll end up in jail, or don't do drugs or you'll fall behind at school. It was a scared straight strategy and it didn't work well. The police officers were often seen as threatening rather than helpful, And instead of teaching kids how to just say no as intended, the program was more focused on teaching kids how to respect authority. This can become a pretty big problem if the children in the classroom see the police as an oppositional force. Telling children they should respect the police officers and anonymous report back on any drugs they encountered at home or school via a box in the classroom, while also implementing a zero tolerance, just say no campaign, doesn't create the open, honest environment needed for true drug use prevention or treatment. Go figure. Then there was the wonderful idea that D.A.R.E. actually created a boomerang effect, meaning that not only were students learning how to say no to drugs, they were also taught how to say yes too. There is some research that suggests that D.A.R.E. introduced children to drugs they would have never learned about without it. They learned the slang terms and the different effects without learning about the physical or emotional consequences. And this didn't keep them away from drugs and it actually pushed them towards it. Whoopsie. In essence, the D.A.R.E. program failed because they refused to listen to the advice and strategies that psychologists and addiction specialists were begging them to use. Teach kids through interactive methods. Don't use police officers to run the curriculum. Educate rather than terrify. All pretty simple solutions and all ignored. That is, of course, until they began losing all their funding. After the program was taken out of schools and exposed as a fraud on the people of America, according to the mayor of Salt Lake City, they finally started to listen and take some advice. And so the keeping it real curriculum was born and disguised as a brand new program. And before we jump into this new curriculum and its unique set of issues, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank today's sponsors. When you run a business, time is ever so precious. Every misplaced moment feels like a missed opportunity, a lost chance to make your business better, or even just step away for a second and recharge. ShipStation gives e-commerce sellers like you more time to do what they really love, unless you really love managing every single little detail of order fulfillment, which I most certainly do not. So it's really no wonder that ShipStation is already trusted by over 100,000 sellers. And with the amount of time that I save using ShipStation, I literally have 
all the time in the world now to be able to formulate new scents for the candle company and work on all the little nitty gritty details of design and upcoming launches. And it's great to have that extra time to focus on the creative while I don't have to focus on the fulfillment portion because ShipStation does it for me. What's also great about ShipStation is you're going to get some amazing, deeply discounted rates that are normally reserved for Fortune 500 companies. And they make it easy to compare carriers, rates, and delivery times. So it's easy to choose the best option for every shipping scenario. And in fact, 98% of companies that use ShipStation for a year keep it as long as they're in business. So I really think that says something as to how easy it is to work with them. So it's time to let go of all those shipping tasks. ShipStation can do it better and faster. Sign up using promo code CASKET for a free 60-day trial today at ShipStation.com and start saving time with every shipment. That's two whole months of shipping made quick and painless, and it's free to try. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in CASKET. ShipStation, make ship happen. Despite the new snazzy and slightly cringeworthy name, Keeping It Real was still very much dare. Only this time, they actually listened to the advice from healthcare professionals on the new program. Keeping It Real became a much more approachable, open version of drug prevention. Gone were the hour-long lectures, the slang glossary, and the parent questionnaire. Instead, the new program would focus on involving students and teaching them in a more hands-on manner. The co-developer of the program said it was not an anti-drug program. Instead, it was about things like being honest and safe and responsible. The program is specifically designed for students that are deemed to be at risk for future drug use. Now, this is the part that rubs me a little bit the wrong way. What puts these kids at high risk, you ask? Well, poverty, immigration status, and different aspects of their culture. So while yes, drug prevention has been found to be the most useful when based on people's cultures and taught by someone the students can relate to, but does that mean they stopped using officers to make the person more relatable? No, absolutely not still run by police officers, despite the multiple findings that doing this was unhelpful, the new program would work on discussion groups. Still full of multi-week lessons, children only had to endure around eight minute lectures before splitting into groups to practice making tough decisions and activities with their friends. Rather than only focusing on drug scenarios and the just say no protocol, students learned a more thorough approach, refuse, explain, avoid, and leave. That's much better. Now, was I the only one that ever wondered what you were supposed to do after just saying no? Did you just stand there awkwardly and wave? Run away screaming? What was the protocol? Well, the new REAL acronym finally addressed the question and they did it with the knowledge of surveys from kids and from asking them what they would want. Groundbreaking stuff here. Instead of just telling kids don't do drugs, they have also begun to explain why they shouldn't do drugs beyond the criminal consequences. Now, kids were learning how drugs could impact their brain development, mental health, and future well-being. Even the biggest naysayers of D.A.R.E. were behind this new program. Many of them helped design it. Richard Clayton, who had previously researched the failure of D.A.R.E. told Education World, D.A.R.E. took the scientific community seriously, worked hard with them, and now D.A.R.E. has become a lot more effective. My hat is off to them. With the new program also came new money. For D.A.R.E., it was sink or change, and they chose to change, which worked tremendously well in their favor. So what about the science of it all? Is this new kinder, gentler version of D.A.R.E. working in the long run? So far, it actually seems to be yes. Though of course, keep in mind, the program does have a history of stifling opposing research. So take the success with a little grain of salt. Still, D.A.R.E.'s new version has been met with positive reviews from the same people that led to the loss of the original program's funding even the Surgeon General. In 2016, the Surgeon General released a report entitled Facing Addiction in America, the Surgeon General's Report on Alcohol, Drugs, and Health. In it, they listed that Keeping It Real was an effective program for building social, emotional, cognitive, and substance refusal skills to prevent future drug use. Some research has even found that the new program is beneficial to people who have already tried or were using drugs. This is something that never occurred with the original. The study, which had about 1,300 students, showed that it reduced substance use at the rate that was 72% higher than the control group. This means that people who were already using drugs stopped or at least slowed down their drug use after their program at a much higher rate than those who never participated. And that's fantastic news. That's exactly what we want when it comes to addressing drug use in the United States. Less criminalization, more empathy and education. So, so far, so good with the new program but it's understandable that some people would still be slow to trust it given Dare's lengthy history of lying to the public about its effectiveness. 
rehabilitation specialists still show some concern over the program being run by police officers, and I don't blame them. Police officers are not trained in mental health issues. They are not trained in trauma. And if they are, they're still not the experts. What is really needed for true drug prevention or rehabilitation is the experts themselves. Ultimately, D.A.R.E. has come a long way from a massive failure to a slow but hopefully effective recovery. Obviously, time will tell if keeping it real is actually going to be an effective program in the long run, but the initial signs seem to point to yes. As for the D.A.R.E. program and the focus of today's episode, it's pretty clear that the D.A.R.E. program failed for a variety of pretty obvious reasons that they knew from the start. And the other pretty obvious detail here is the war on drugs as a whole was not a super successful thing and programs that came out of it like D.A.R.E. also had huge plot holes that just really couldn't be fixed. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's one of those moments where if you trust science and you look at really unbiased and fair experiments and you read through the studies, you're gonna find the answers right there in black and white. And if you don't choose to use them, you might fuck a bunch of kids up for about 30 years. But hey, what do I know? So with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing. And if you're checking this out on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscription bell so that you can be notified every single time a new episode is uploaded. Thank you again for joining me in today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.